Hello, everyone. Welcome to this presentation on the BC Arts Council's Early Career Development Program. We will be talking specifically about the application process for organizations applying for either an internship or cohort project. We at the BC Arts Council carry out our work on the land of Indigenous nations throughout what is colonially known as British Columbia, and we're grateful for the continuing relationships with Indigenous people in BC that develop through our work together. We offer gratitude to the Lekwungen people, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, on whose ancestral lands we operate our main offices and where Michelle and I are recording this today. My name is Erin Macklem. I'm a program advisor at the BC Arts Council, and I'm joined by my fellow program advisor, Michelle Benjamin. Together, we co-facilitate the Early Career Development Program, with Michelle taking the studio arts disciplines, such as visual and media arts, literary arts, as well as museums and cultural centers. And I take responsibility for the performing arts disciplines, including dance, theater, music, comedy, circus, and interdisciplinary performing arts. But really, we work together very closely on this entire program intake, and we're happy to advise you or redirect you to the appropriate person. In this presentation, we will go through the Early Career Development Program application form section by section, and we'll provide guidance on what we're asking you to share about your project, how questions relate to the assessment criteria, and how to address that criteria in your responses. If you don't have this already, it would be useful to have a copy of the program guidelines handy. You can download those from the program page on our website. You'll find a complete application preview in Microsoft Word on the program page as well. This is a useful document to use as you start to prepare your application. It's designed to work with screen readers, and it also allows you to work offline on your answers that you can then cut and paste into the application. For an overview of the BC Arts Council, our strategic plan, the guidelines for the Early Career Development Program, and some grant writing tips, you can watch our other pre-recorded presentation available on our website on the Early Career Development page. If you have additional questions, please contact either one of us via email and we will be happy to help you sort through the application. Our contact, available, uh, our contact information will be available at the end of this presentation. So the Early Career Development application intake is open now and closes on Friday, June 30th at 11.59 p.m. We suggest that you submit your application in advance of that, though, as after 5 p.m. our offices close and we wouldn't be able to help you uh, to support any last minute technical issues you might have. If you've not already registered in our online system, you should do that as soon as you have finished watching this presentation. The Early Career Development Program is open to individual and organizational applicants, but in this video, we will be discussing the components that are open to organizations only. If you're an individual looking to apply, please see our other video for individuals. So we're going to launch right into a review of the application questions for this program. The application is organized into eight tabs that you'll see on the screen. The questions in the tabs correspond generally with the assessment criteria as outlined on pages eight and nine of the program guidelines. And we'll get into that in more detail a bit later. So we'll start with some general tips that will be helpful as you start to answer the questions. So first, pay attention to the word counts. Each question has, uh, each text question has a, a word count uh, that indicates the maximum number of words. So this is the maximum allowable words. You do not have to write the max, maximum number of words. Use as many words as you need to express your idea or to answer the question up to the maximum. If you are working in the application preview, you should be aware that the way Microsoft Word counts words may not be exactly the same as how our online system counts words. So it's a good idea to paste your responses into the online system early to avoid having to make last minute edits. So clarity is more important than fancy language. With a series of long sentences, it can be challenging for the assessors to get a sense of you and your project. We recommend short, clear sentences or even point form as long as you provide answers that are fully responding to each question. The assessors are not marking your grammar, but they do need clear and concise information. An asterisk next to a question indicates that that field is mandatory. The system will not let you submit your application until you have added an answer to every mandatory question. Here are a couple of considerations that are more specific to the Early Career Development Program. These applications will be assessed by a multidisciplinary panel. This means that the assessors reading your applications will come from a range of practices. It's important to remember that they may not be familiar with your organization, your work, 
or your specific practice, communities, or cultures. Be sure to provide the information they need to understand your project. Avoid or explain any uh, technical terms, academic language, or any expressions that may be difficult to understand. Some examples might be somatic practice, land-based, polyphonic, or verbing. If it's important to your application to use specialized terms, include a brief definition or description of their meaning. Remember that this program is called Early Career Development, not Organizational Development. The priority is to support the learning and career development of early career practitioners. While it is possible that the intern or cohort may be providing benefits to the organization, remember to center the experience of the early career practitioner when describing the project and the activities. So we'll start with the profile details tab. This is the first tab in the online application. The information on this tab is self-generated by the system and it's connected to your organization profile. You should review it for accuracy. And if anything in the profile summary is not correct, go to your profile in the system and update it before completing the application. Any changes to address, your address must be submitted via email to the BC Arts Council address, that's bcartscouncil at gov.bc.ca. So as part of this review process, make sure that your board and staff member lists are up to date. Confirm that you have uploaded signed financial statements for the two most recently completed fiscal years. Update your profile with your organization's statement of purpose. For nonprofits, this would be a PDF document of your organization's constitution. This is required prior to submitting your application. Confirm the date your society annual report was last filed with the Registrar of Companies. In alignment with our strategic plan, new foundations and extending foundations, the BC Arts Council has committed to targeted investment in underserved and equity deserving organizations and the development of equity support initiatives. This includes a policy to support designated priority groups. The BC Arts Council's designated priority groups include applicants and arts and cultural practitioners who are indigenous, so that's First Nations, Métis and or Inuit people, uh, those who are deaf or experience disability, uh, black or people of color, and those who are located in regional areas, so outside of Greater Vancouver or the capital region. In order to identify as a designated priority group, an organization must demonstrate that the majority of their activities, programming content, and financial and human resources are dedicated to one of the BC Arts Council's designated priority groups. Organizations that would like to identify as part of a designated prior priority group must complete the designated priority groups and equity data tool sections in the organizational profile. So we encourage all applicants to complete these tabs. If you have already completed the designated priority group tab, you should know that we have recently made changes. On the organization profile, click the designated priority groups tab and look for the headline labeled new to submit this brief additional information. The information that you enter in the designated priority group and equity data tool tabs is not provided to assessors. If identity factors are an important consideration or context for your organization or artistic practice, consider referencing them within your application responses. Once these sections are completed, you do not need to update them again unless there are changes to your information. Next, we'll talk about the applicant details tab. The first questions, what is the applicant's primary field of practice? This is used to identify what you do and to provide context to your application for the assessors. This information guides us as we assign your application to a specific assessment group. The eligible practices are listed in the guidelines. If you don't see your practice listed, reach out to Michelle or me for clarification. Next, you'll see Criminal Record Review Act. Check this box to confirm that the applicant adheres to the Criminal Record Review Act, which requires that people who work with or may have unsupervised access to children or vulnerable adults must undergo a criminal record check by the Criminal Records Review Program. The next question asks you to describe your organization's history, mandate, mission, and core values. Briefly summarize its history in the creation, development, production, or dissemination within your field of arts practice in British Columbia. 
This question is designed to introduce the assessors to your organization and to start building your case for why you are well suited and capable of managing this project in an effective way. And finally, we ask for some financial information. You'll be asked to provide the actual total operating expenses from the most recently completed fiscal year and the projected total operating expenses from the current fiscal year. Now we'll talk about the project information tab. This tab includes most of the key questions in the application, and this is also where you will upload some important documents. The first section includes basic information that will allow the assessors to understand the focus of your application. These questions are, which component are you applying for? You'll select either internship or cohort. It's a good idea to answer this question early in your application process as your selection determines the kinds of questions that will appear for you later in the application. If you have not selected one of these two responses, you may run into gaps in your application later on. Next, enter the amount you are requesting through this program. Be sure that the amount requested matches the amount in the budget section of the application. Double check this before you submit. Next, enter your project start and end dates, remembering that the project cannot start before the closing date of this program, which is June 30th. Next, provide a brief description. This is an important piece as it helps to inform the initial eligibility review for your project and also helps to remind the assessors about your project, especially after they've been reviewing 40 or 50 or more of these applications. Be clear and concise, refer to your project and your practice, and any other important details that you can fit into the space allowed. For example, a six month internship for an emerging editor at an indigenous led book publishing company or a one-year cohort project with four emerging dancers who will be mentoring with a professional choreographer. Continuing in the project, uh, the project overview and the project information tab, these are additional questions to provide specific context and details for the project. What is the job title for the intern or cohort? For how many weeks will the project run? Remember this needs to be at least eight weeks and no more than 52 weeks. How many hours per week will the early career practitioners be working? What is the hourly wage? What are you going to pay the intern and the cohort participants? We also ask you to provide context for that wage through a statement to contextualize the proposed rate of pay in relation to comparable pay levels within the organization, number of hours worked, and the living wage in your area and sector. We ask you to identify the location of the project. We ask, for the residence of the early career practitioner. If the early career practitioner does not normally reside in the community in which the project takes place, we want to know their usual community of residence. Before we talk about the rest of the questions in the application, we want to review the assessment criteria, which you will find in full in the program guidelines. The three areas of assessment are impact on the early career practitioner, impact on the art sector and community, and third, feasibility. You should notice that the three sections are weighted differently, and this reflects the priorities of the program. Read the detailed assessment criteria in the guidelines, and make sure your answers reflect the criteria whenever it's relevant or applicable. The questions in the application are designed to respond directly to this assessment criteria, and this criteria is the primary lens through which the assessors review and consider your application, and it is how they determine the merit and impact of your project. In the Extending Foundations Action Plan, the BC Arts Council committed to placing reconciliation, equity, diversity, inclusion, and access at the center of its activities with the intention to address historic funding inequities. Equity considerations are embedded throughout the assessment criteria and the assessment process. So we'll start by reviewing the assessment criteria and then we'll go through the related questions. So the first area of assessment, impact on the early career practitioner, is weighted at 50% of the overall scoring. And so your responses to the questions in this area should reflect this priority. When considering the impacts of the project on the early career practitioner, the assessment panel will assess the impact on the early career practitioner's artistic or professional practice. So how is this activity going to take the early career practitioner, their practice, and their career to the next level? 
They'll consider the significance and depth of knowledge transfer and learning and the opportunities for the early career practitioners professional growth and the development of the next stage of their career. So is this going to help uh, launch a small step in their skill development, career growth and learning, or is this a giant leap? Is this specialized knowledge transfer that can only be gained by doing this activity under these circumstances? Or is this something they could look up on YouTube? What is their long-term trajectory and how will this project support their long-term goals? The next criteria is the timeliness, urgency, and relevance of the activities in relation to the early career practitioner's learning or career development goals. So why is this project particularly timely or urgent? And finally, what is the suitability of the mentor and organization relative to the early career practitioner's experience and learning goals? So is your organization the right place for this emerging artist to learn? Is a designated mentor the ideal and even perfect person to be guiding the early career practitioner at this stage of their career? So that's a quick review of the assessment criteria. And now we'll go over in more detail how the application questions allow you to respond to this criteria. So the questions related to this assessment criteria are still on the project information tab. And we're looking specifically at the questions under the section, section headed impact on the early career practitioner. So the first thing here is to enter the early career practitioner's name, a single name for an intern and multiple names for cohort. So next is their basic training information. This is a table in which we ask you to provide the most recent and relevant training or education for the early career practitioner. So you'll provide the early career practitioner's name, the kind of training, for example, uh, apprenticeship or an undergraduate degree or traditional knowledge transfer. Next, we'll ask for the focus of the training or the name of the program. So um, master's in fine arts and painting or an apprenticeship in traditional wooden canoe carving. Next, we ask for the name of the institution or the traditional knowledge keeper or the mentor. And then finally, we wanna know the month and the year that that training was completed. So next, uh, there's a text box that uh, asks for a summary of any other relevant training. And the key here is relevant. If you're applying for an intern in a visual arts organization, it might not be relevant to include the intern's dance training. Next, describe up to three recent and relevant career or training highlights. So examples might include significant projects, awards, or exceptional opportunities. This question helps the assessors to determine the level at which the intern is working, as well as their capacity to take on and complete the project you are applying for. It will also help them to assess the impact of this learning opportunity on the early career practitioner. So again, choose examples that are relevant to the proposed activity. The next question in this section is probably the most important part of this application. You're asked to upload a biographical statement from the early career practitioner. This statement isn't something that the organization writes. This is something the intern or cohort members prepare. It should be in their own voice and it should address the following. A brief description of their current practice, a summary of their learning objectives and their career or practice development goals, a description of the potential impact this project will have on their artistic or professional practice. So what will they learn? And while you won't be writing this statement for the early career practitioner, if they're looking for advice on how to approach these pieces, you can share that the assessors will be looking for specifics here. For example, them saying, I want to become a better painter. It's pretty vague. Indeed, they might, uh, instead, they might say something like, I want to learn how to create texture and develop more, a more diverse color palette with conventional hues and paints, improving the depth of my representations and my ability to deliver realistic representations through nuanced coloring. Or another example might be, I'm going to improve my knowledge of lighting systems. That's not very specific. Instead, try. I will learn to work with a variety of new models of lighting fixtures, including the Source 9000, a modern AI supported LED light with moving systems that contain many projectors, allowing me to map projections in significantly more complex ways and on surfaces that are moving in tandem with the lights. That's a much more compelling and informative description for the assessors. And notice that while this hypothetical applicant was veering into some of that technical jargon we cautioned about earlier when talking about the Source 9000 lighting instrument, they did explain exactly what it was. 
So also in this biographical statement, we're asking the early career practitioners to reflect on how the impact on them will be measured and how will this project have an impact on the potential for future opportunities and their long-term career trajectory. So in terms of measurement, this doesn't have to be graphs and pie charts. The assessors want to know how the early career practitioner will know that they have achieved their learning goals. What will be the specific impact of this program on them and their learning objectives? What will success look like for them? We also want them to address the question of timing with the question, what is, uh, why is this the right time for you to engage in this activity? So that can be thought of as why is this the right time in terms of their practice or career or their life outside of their practice or at this moment in the world? And then finally, we want to know about the wider implications of this project and ask them to respond to the question of what artistic, cultural, geographic, or other communities do you engage with? And how will this project have an impact on these communities? This is where we want them to talk about the broader context for their work. Are they engaged with a specific community of artists who share their practice? If yes, how will this experience impact or benefit that community? Do they practice an art form that is very specific to their cultural community? For example, Chinese opera or Haida carving? Will the impact of this project be spread into that community? Do they live in a small town in Northern BC? Will they carry the learning into that geographic community in some significant way? We want them to think about these things as they work with the organization to map out the project. As part of our commitment to accessibility, this biographical statement can be created and submitted in a variety of formats, although you must choose only one. It can be a written two-page document, or it can be in audio or ASL formats. This is not intended to be fancy or show off high production values. This is intended to offer options that best align with the early career practitioner's preferred means of communication. The specific instructions and restrictions on these options are visible in the application and the application preview. So still looking at questions that are directly relevant to the impact on the early career practitioner assessment criteria. And remember, this section is weighted at 50% of the total scoring. You will be also be asked the rationale for the selection of the intern or cohort members. Why have you chosen this specific early career practitioner? What are they bringing to the project? What is the synergy between them and your organization? Next, what are the qualifications and skills required? What kind of experience or qualifications are you specifically looking for in the intern or cohort members? What is the name of the mentor within your organization and their job title? You must identify a mentor within your organization. That mentor must have the experience and capacity to work with the early career practitioner and to help them achieve their learning goals and objectives. Then finally, how will your organization and the identified mentor support the intern or cohort particip participants to achieve their learning objectives? Most importantly, how will the organization and this mentor set the early career practitioner up for success in this project and beyond? Moving into the next area of assessment, this is impact on the community and the arts sector, which is weighted at 30% of the overall scoring. You can think about this section as zooming out or taking a wide angle view of the early career practitioner, your organization and your project. Your organization is part of the arts and culture sector and you intersect with many different communities. Some examples might be your geographic community where you're located or your community of practice, the discipline or art form that you work in or your cultural community or your community of organizations with similar mandates and so on. The same is true for the early career practitioner you wish to work with. There are many different aspects you can consider when thinking about your and the early career practitioners' relationships to the sector and to communities. And it's up to your organization and the early career practitioners to define these for yourselves. In the context of this grant, we are asking your organization and the early career practitioners to situate and articulate your relationships to your various communities as appropriate, and to speak to how your practice and this project will intersect with and have an impact on them. We recognize that not all of these points are going to be relevant to every project, but we encourage all applicants to reflect on the criteria and really consider if these criteria are somehow reflected in the project. So, in terms of those assessment criteria, 
when considering the project's impacts on the organizations and early career practitioners identified communities and BC's arts and culture sector more broadly, the assessment panel will consider any opportunities for reclamation, preservation, and or innovation of the art form or practice. They'll consider if the project makes a meaningful contribution to the practices of equity deserving arts practitioners and cultural communities. Has thought been given to the integrity of the project, including ethical approaches to research, collaborative processes, source materials, cultural considerations and protocols? And has consideration been given to engagement with indigenous people, communities, practices, materials and beliefs? What is the timeliness, urgency, and relevance of your activities in relation to identified needs in the sector? And continuing on in this assessment area, uh, they'll be considering if the project makes a contribution to rural and remote communities, if it will have an impact on or provide benefits for the organization and the lead mentor or mentors, and if there are any opportunities for reciprocal learning, and finally, if thought has been given to accessibility in this project, which could be things like accessibility of physical spaces, financial accessibility, and supports for those who experience barriers or disability. Well, the questions in the application that relate to the impact on the community and the art sector assessment criteria are as follows. So first, what is the anticipated impact on and benefits for the organization and mentors and opportunities for reciprocal learning? So what skills, knowledge, perspectives, or experience might your intern or cohort members be sharing with or bringing to your organization? And then, if your project involves working with individuals or materials from communities outside your own, particularly those that have been historically underserved, Describe the steps taken to collaborate with these communities, respect protocols, and integrate an equitable and ethical approach in your work. We'll get into this one uh, in more detail when we review the next question. Continuing with the impact on the community and art sector, how might this project contribute to the art form or practice, including reclamation, preservation, or innovation? If it is relevant to the project, Talk about how this work might help to build, enhance, and develop your artistic practice. Will the early career practitioner's work help to bring back a lost art form or preserve one that is at risk of being lost? Is it exploring new or innovative approaches? The next question is, does this project address an identified need in the sector? And if yes, describe that need and how the project will address it. It can be difficult sometimes in a cross-disciplinary panel for all of the assessors to understand the needs and gaps within specific disciplines. So if your sector needs access to skills or practices that will be developed through this program, make sure the assessors know that. Likewise, if there are particular voices missing from your sector due to systemic barriers or other factors, offer some context for how this voice is important to be heard in your area of practice or in the arts and culture sector more broadly. So continuing on in the project information tab and in the impact on the community and arts sector section, the next two questions are, how will this activity have an impact on your community or communities? And this could mean any or all of your artistic, cultural, geographic, or other communities. And does your project engage with First Nations, Métis, or Inuit peoples, communities, or content? If yes, provide context to your relationship and describe plans to ensure a respectful, ethical, and culturally safe engagement. As we mentioned when we were introducing this area of assessment, we are asking you and the early career practitioners to recognize and acknowledge your relationships to various communities and to speak to how the practice and this project will intersect with and have an impact on them. Think about both immediate and long-term impacts. Some of this criteria and these questions stem from the BC Arts Council recognizing that systemic racism and colonialism have had far-reaching negative impacts on many marginalized and equity-seeking communities. If your project intersects with communities that are not your own or not those of the early career practitioner, the assessors would like to know what knowledge or connection your organization or the intern or cohort members have to those communities and if this work can be done without perpetuating historic harms. 
Also, will this project positively contribute to that community in some way? If so, the assessors want to know that. They want to understand how you have developed your project with consideration for ethical and responsible practices in research, collaboration, the use of source materials, as well as cultural considerations and protocols. They also want to know how or whether the project might make meaningful contributions to equity deserving and underrepresented artistic practices, arts practitioners and cultural communities. Final question that aligns with the impact on the community and art sector criteria is describe any accessibility challenges your project may present and how you plan to address them. Consider physical spaces, affordability, and support for those who experience barriers or disability. So we ask that you consider the accessibility of your project. This could be accessibility for the early career practitioner, the mentor, or others that may be engaging with the project in some way. Are the spaces you will be working in physically accessible to all who need access? Are washrooms accessible both physically and from a gender inclusive perspective? Are activities fi financially accessible to everyone involved? Are they affordable? This may not be a consideration in every project, but if your project involves, for example, tickets to public presentations or entry fees as part of your related work, it's good to consider this piece. Might you need any assistive technologies to facilitate full participation in any activities? Assessors want to know that you've given consideration to any barriers that participants may come up against or any supports that may be needed. How do you plan to address those challenges and remove barriers to access? Now we'll move into the third and final assessment criteria, that is feasibility. This area is weighted at 20% of the overall scoring. The questions here allow the assessors to understand the viability of the project. They will consider the following. The clarity of the work plan or timeline and appropriateness of the timeline to the learning outcomes. Is the project long enough? Is it too long? Is it a one-year project that, given the depth of learning and instruction, should only be six months? Have you packed a year's worth of learning into 12 weeks? Are all expenses in the budget clear and appropriate? Is everyone who is getting paid getting paid fairly? Does the early career practitioner have the experience and capacity to undertake the project? Is it too high level? Is the learning too basic? Do they have other things going on that limits their available time to focus on this activity? Will the experience and capacity of the mentors and host organizations assure the assessors that they can undertake and support the project? What measures are in place to ensure a culturally, emotionally, and physically safe environment for all participants? And what are the human resource practices and policies in relation to providing fair remuneration, equitable employment, and a safe, respectful work environment? So in the application, these are the questions and prompts that you'll find that are designed to respond directly to the feasibility criteria. Describe the organization's current artistic programming and upcoming activities relevant to the proposed position. Include two recent achievements that support the likelihood of success of the proposed project. This is where you'll let the assessors know that you have the experience, infrastructure, and capacity to take on this project and to work with the early career practitioner towards achieving their learning goals. What is it that your organization has already done or does currently or is planning to do that has prepared it to successfully complete this project and this activity with the early career practitioner? Next, you're asked to upload a detailed work plan, including a schedule or timeline appropriate to the learning opportunities and projected outcomes. Describe the activities the early career practitioner will be engaged in, with whom and when. The timeline that you present should match the learning activities, and it should provide a sensible work plan that enables the early career practitioner to achieve what they set out to do. Not too long so that it feels thin and stretched out. Not too short so that it doesn't seem attainable. The timeline can be based on a weekly or monthly schedule. You'll adjust this based on the overall length of your project and the specifics of your work plan. Does it make sense to go week by week in a year-long project? That's probably getting too much into the minutia for this grant. Will providing a month-to-month -month plan for an eight-week project provide enough detail for the assessors to get a sense of your activities? Probably not. 
So you'll need to find a balance appropriate to your project for communicating the schedule of activities. And remember that the dates in the timeline should match the start and end dates that you provided earlier in the application. Next question, will artists, arts and cultural practitioners and technicians involved with this project be paid in alignment with industry standards within the field of practice? For example, cardback rates or those set out in the Canadian Theatre Agreement? This is a yes or no question, but you have the opportunity to offer context with explain how fair compensation will be determined within the project and or community context. The next question, will elders and or traditional knowledge keepers involved with this project be compensated fairly according to community contexts? And again, explain how the compensation level was determined. It's fundamental to all BC Arts Council programs that artists and arts practitioners are fairly and equitably compensated. So tell us how you're doing that, if it's relevant to your project. And we also want to know how you developed your rates of compensation. Did you consult an industry recommended minimum fee schedule? Did you consult community members to understand what was an appropriate amount? Continuing on with feasibility related questions, how does the organization foster a healthy, safe and respectful workplace? Briefly describe the organizational and or human resource practices and policies related to equitable employment, cultural competency and safety, anti-harassment, etc. And provide an overview of the organization's expertise and capacity to manage the positions. So here is where you assure the assessors that your organization is able to effectively, safely, and responsibly manage the project and the needs of the intern or cohorts. In particular, we want to know that the mentor has the experience and capacity to pay attention to the learning goals and process, to be aware and responsive to any issues of cultural safety or comfort, and to ensure that the early career practitioner has a positive and enriching experience while working with your organization. So next we'll move on to the budget tab that includes the expense summary form. All applicants must complete the budget form and we encourage you to provide detailed notes throughout. So the maximum request for this program is $30,000. Uh, you should have a good look at the program guidelines for a list of ineligible expenses. Uh, ineligible expenses can be included in your budget, but they must be covered by non BC Arts Council revenue sources and identified in the notes. So you need to identify your in kind revenue. These, con these contributions must include a corresponding in kind expense. There are specific sections in the budget to identify in kind expenses and in kind revenues, and these sections must balance. Similarly, the total projected revenues must equal your uh, projected expenses. So in other words, your whole budget must balance. And finally, you should provide specifics in the notes section. Help the assessors to understand where these numbers come from. It is not necessary to complete each line in the budget and you can leave an expense or revenue field blank as appropriate. The most important spent expense line here is the compensation paid to the intern or cohort participants. It is a priority for this program that the early career participants are fairly compensated for the work they do through this project. You'll see additional notes for each of these lines in the guidelines. So next is the revenue section and you will be asked to indicate if the revenue source is confirmed or pending. So if you've applied for another grant and you haven't heard, heard yet, that would be pending. If it's money that you've already put aside for this project, that would be uh, confirmed. So in-kind revenue, as we've discussed, and, and then a section for earned, contributed, and private sector revenues, and a section for public sector revenues. Again, it is not necessary to have additional revenue. This program can fund up to 100% of the project as long as all expenses are eligible. So now we'll move to the support material tab. So all support material should be in PDF format. First, we ask you to upload two policy documents that are relevant to human resources, cultural safety, etc., in your organization as available. So these could be uh, current planning and policy documents, such as strategic plan, a human resource policy, anti-racism policy, or cultural safety policy. It could include documents describing your approach to equity in your organization. If standalone policy documents are not available, you must describe your practices and policies within the application. 
Uh, next, we give you the opportunity to upload letters from up to two partners or collaborators, if applicable, confirming the nature of their participation. So this should not be general letters of support. So if your organization is working in partnership with another organization or an individual on this activity, then the assessors will want to hear from them in their own words to understand how the partnership impacts the activities and outcomes. And finally, we ask for a one page biographical statement from the designated mentor within the organization, indicating their relevant experience and qualifications and outlining their capacity for and commitment to working with the intern or cohort members for the duration of the project. So this should reflect on the specific early career practitioner and their stated needs and goals. Next, we'll move into the Access Support tab. The Access Support program provides an additional contribution towards costs for specific accessibility services, rental equipment, and other supports required to carry out a project funded by the BC Arts Council. Access Support requests are available to organizations with a primary purpose to support practitioners who are deaf or have a disability, as specified in the organization's constitution. For more information, visit our website at bcartscouncil.ca slash accessibility. Next, we'll look at the feedback tab. We're always looking for ways to improve how we communicate with the arts and culture sector in BC. This section is optional and is not part of the application, but your answers will help us improve the services we provide. We ask questions like, how did you learn about the intake for this program? Is this your first application to the BC Arts Council? Have you received BC Arts Council funding in the past? How long did this application take you to complete? We appreciate you taking the time to fill out this section so we can see where we are doing well and where we can make improvements in our work. And then finally, the final tab is the declaration tab. And in this tab, you will confirm and promise that you meet the eligibility criteria for this program, that the information you provided in the application is complete and true, and that you will abide by all applicable laws, and that you consent to the BC Arts Council collecting, protecting, and sharing your information in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. These aren't text boxes for you to fill in. This is simply you checking a box confirming all of this important information to be true before you submit your application. That brings us to the end of our presentation. We wanna thank you for your interest in the Early Career Development Program. Please reach out if you have any questions and you can follow our social media channels on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date on all of our news and uh, programs. As we've mentioned, Michelle and I co-manage the Early Career Development Program with responsibility in specific areas. If you have questions uh, relating to the performing arts, dance, theater, music, comedy, circus, and interdisciplinary performing arts practice, you can reach out to me. And if you have questions within the studio arts realm, media arts, visual arts, literary arts, museums, and Indigenous cultural centers, you can reach out to Michelle. And we look forward to hearing from you with your questions. Thanks for watching. Thanks, everyone.